Have you ever find yourselves in a position of being at the end of the rope? <laughs> Is that an amen? <laughs> we constantly find ourselves at the end of the rope. Is that guy over there, can you actually see the guy? I intentionally uh, made it like really uh, dark so that uh, uh, you can just kind of try to imagine uh, the times when you're at the end of the rope, how endless that time has been and how difficult, how anxious it has been. And uh, we all have those times in our lives, whether it's a financial crisis, health issue, the relationship issue, whatever it is, we all found ourselves at the end of the rope. The key of the message today is, what did you find at the end of the rope? What did you find at the end of the rope? Well, a couple of days ago, I got a call from someone I did not know, a stranger. And um, this person was definitely at the end of the rope. And um, I got the call, and she said something to the effect, you know, Pastor, I've been uh, listening to your sermon um, online and also uh, YouTube and, um, and gave me the courage uh, to, to call upon you because you are a pastor, also a business person. So you understand our world. Obviously, she was in the business. And uh, there was a sense of a desperate voice in her heart. And the question was, how do I find favor from God? Because I'm not seeing it. I've been going to church for a long time, but I struggle all the time. Everything I try to do, there is as if I'm, she didn't say this, but as if I'm at the end of the rope. Like, why is always a struggle uh, living uh, with God? Now, she tried to explain to me her business is something about providing some kind of service to uh, seniors. I quite understood exactly what she was doing. Uh, but she's been doing this for some time, but just she's constantly struggling with the relationship issues and then so financial issues. As if she needs to close this business 100 times before. Since I was listening, and I didn't know how to answer because I didn't have the full extent of her situation or circumstance. But as you know, whenever somebody asks me a question, I usually pray to God. God, in about two, three seconds, if not in about 30 seconds, this person will be done with this question. And I'm not sure which way this person is going. But I need, I'm in a position with that I need to answer this question, so you better give me some wisdom here. So I always pray this prayer. And you should guys try to do the same thing. Seek him, and God will give you. And um, so I responded by saying, so you're seeking, you're seeking God's favor. It appears that you are at the end of the rope, whether to give up or not to give up. And she said, exactly. But first of all, I said, most of the time, we must understand, if you're seeking favor, favor is something you get in return for a good deed that you did in the eyes of the Lord. That's a favor. But the grace is something you get even though you don't deserve. So then I proceeded to go on to answer her question with an illustration. I didn't know how to explain how to find favor from God. So I told the story that I often tell you, told you in the past about when I decided to go into business, the thing that I think I did that was good in the eyes of the Lord. 
So I went on to explain that. And I said, I was in the same position about some 20 some, five some, 20 some, 25 some years ago. And I didn't know what I was getting into. But I know I needed some business. I needed it for my livelihood. I needed it for my medicine that was uh, uh, amazingly expensive that uh, my insurance ran out. And I was in the, in the financially very difficult position. So I had to do this. And God showed his favor. First through man and also through God. And she was like anxious to listen to. I need both. I need a favor from man, the people around me, and also I need a favor from God. So I went on to explain, you need to do something if you want to receive a favor, not only from God, but also from man. You need to continue to deposit the good deeds in the hearts of the people around you. So I went to explain the favor that I received. And it was a consequence of of overcoming the temptation of trying to take away a contract from my previous company. Remember, I got the call just the three days before that I started a new business. It was like Wednesday and Thursday that I got this call from the client saying that, Tim, I have a great job for you. I need you to get going. I was so tempted, I was explaining this to her, to say to this client, can you call me next week? Can you call me next week? But I did not. I wanted to do what is good in the eyes of man and also in the eyes of God. So that was a like good project, this perfect project for, that will feed my family for entire one year. Perfect job. And I gave that up. I sent the proposal, signed it on BF of my previous company, and when I left, I gave this, and the, the guy signed it, and then sent it back, start work on it, and he gave the project to my previous company, and then I left. The bottom line is, when I started the company, this client was a little bit upset and saying, why didn't you tell me? I said, what is right in the eyes of the Lord and to the mankind is that I do not take this job away from my previous company. He was touched, he was moved, and he gave me all kinds of projects ever since. That's the favor from man. And from God, you know, he must have moved people. And my previous company actually called me and said, can you work on this project? I got a favor from both God and man. And there was total silence in the other line. And slightly choking and yet with a moved voice, I think I got what I needed to hear. And we hung up. A total stranger. I didn't even have to go to the grace part. I think she knew the grace part. Definitely she was a believer. A grace part where you get even though you do not deserve the grace of God. So now for the grace. If we are facing at the end of the rope and we don't feel that we have done enough deposit with God, that you don't feel that you deserve a favor from God, but you can still Bring it at the feet of Jesus. And if you confess of those wrongdoings and believe that God will come in the nick of time for your rescue, he will be there to give you that favor as well. And he made this promise. It's never what I live you, never what I forsake you. My grace is sufficient for you. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. These are the words that encourage us when we're at the end of the road. Those words are not just the words of God, but it's he himself. Because in the Genesis, God said, I formed you guys, us, from the dust 
by breathing into our nostrils the breath of life. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God breathed. So therefore, so therefore, the word of God is alive and it's active. It's not just the word that's just simply casted in some concrete or in the, in, in, imprinted in the paper. And it's actually, it's God himself who is active and alive. You must believe that. So when you're at the end of the rope, he is active and he is alive to take us home. For the Bible says in the Psalm 20, verse 1 through 5, this is what it says. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. When you are at the end of the rope. Next slide would help. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. That's saying, when you are at the end of the rope, may he send you help, the life savior, the rope, from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. Here. This is where the favor comes in. This is where we need to deposit lots of good deeds with God. In addition to grace that we have already received. May he remember all your sacrifice and accept your burnt offerings. So I, time to time I tell you this. When you are in need of something, don't just say, God, help me, help me. Well, I know it's all implied. But say it verbally. Out loud in your uh, prayers, God, I am striped right now. I am I'm lost. I'm at the end of the rope. But you remember, when I was in love with you very first time, I sacrificed this, 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 because of your name. Say those things. Let him hear what you have done, and the burnt offerings, commitment and dedication that you have offered to him. First of all, may he give you the desires of your heart and make all your plans succeed. This is a favor from God. When you're at the end of the rope, when you come to God and seek him, He'll give you desires of your heart and make all your plans succeed. We will then shout for joy when we are victorious and we'll lift our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. This is Bible verse that I read again and again and again when I was in the hospital. I have not done a whole lot of goods, but a little thing that I had, for example, I remember specifically, what's a good thing that the sacrifice that I made for God? Oh, I didn't give a whole lot of offerings, a little bit, when I was young. So I couldn't talk about that. I remember just trying to hold on to something to God and trying to negotiate with God. You know what I said to him? I sacrificed all my Sundays for you. That's one thing I did. I did not miss Sunday church. Well, I guess the, the older generation, you know, we go to church, right? <laughs> we just go to church. So I encourage all the uh, uh, travelers, when you travel, you know, into uh, different uh, places, I always make sure that I go to church on Sunday. It doesn't matter whether the church that I know, it doesn't, I just go because it's part of what I do because I know as far as I'm concerned, that would please God. So that's how I used to bargain the table, chip with my God. It says, I did this, you know. I don't travel, Scott, on Sundays. Yeah, I go to restaurants on Sundays, but 
I don't travel on Sundays because I am doing my very best to keep that Sunday as a holiday as much as I can. Yeah, there are times, you know, I'm so traveling so much. There are times I just want to hop in the plane on Sunday. But I said, no, I will fly on Monday. Recently, I heard someone telling me a real story that he witnessed about a guy who went over the cliff and was hanging to dear life by tree branch. And this is tied with, uh, with the uh, a story of one asking, do you know God's address? God's address? Well, God's address is up there. It's heaven. Well, that's like, God, that's like when we die. Who cares when we die? Well, actually, we do care. But it's not, it doesn't, it's not relevant to us right now as long as we are alive. That's a great address when we are called to be with him. But when we're living here on earth, what is God's address? When you're seeking him and you're trying to find him, what is his address so we can go to him? So this guy tells me the story that he witnessed about a guy who went over the cliff and was hanging to dear life. So soon after, a helicopter came and hovered over this guy and a rescuer came down and tied his harness to this guy, and, the, and they had the helicopter raise uh, the rope to bring both of them into helicopter to save the lives. If you go ask this guy, what is or where is God's address? He will tell you that God's address is at the end. Of the rope. That's where I found our God once again. You see, when we're at the end of the rope, that's uh, wonderful. This is a chance. It's an opportunity that God has given us to find Him there. His address, God's address, at the end of the rope. Yes, God's address is the 550 Township Line Road, Cabri Visitor Church too. But the real God's address here on earth is at the end of the rope. And this is his promise through his word, Isaiah 55, verse 11. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. What a comfort that is. When he speaks his word, that which is active and alive, when he comes back, he will not come back empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That's God's promise, and that's our hope. We will never know God's provision. But we do know God's intent. And that intent is to bring us back. His intent is to meet us at the end of the rope. He promised that when we dwell in him, when we dwell in his word, he will not leave us alone empty. God will finish his intent, his provision, his purpose. He will not, he will not return empty. There's a ministry called Gideon's Ministry. They provide Bibles. They provide the Bibles where rubber meets the road, where people are at the end of the road. And when we're in distress, Their ministry is believing that there is power in the Word of God. So today, as part of our message, I want to ask 
our good friend Ed Sutherland to come give us his personal testimony as to how the Word of God has been with him and pulled him together at the end of the road. By the way, this picture that you see, it's actually a picture that I took. It's a, uh, it's a car, a car of encouragement. And as I was preparing this message, and Jenna comes along and says, Tim, I need you to sign this for this person. She needs a little encouragement. And I looked at it and said, wow, this is amazing. This is my today's talk. <laughs> and guess what I wrote on that, um, on that uh, car? He is at the end of the rope. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk with Pastor Haas about uh, my visit today. Um, I wanted to relate to you my experience uh, before I became a Gideon. Uh, I'm an accountant by trade, and you may have heard of a CPA, a Certified Public Accountant. We have to take a test to become uh, certified. And as a young man, I uh, had uh, an experience before I got married, and God spoke to me and uh, cleared the way for my marriage to my lovely wife, Lori. And uh, after we were married, I had uh, uh, the opportunity to take the CPA exam. I had taken it twice and failed miserably. Um, and uh, this was my third time. I was working in the city of Bennington, Vermont. So I had to take the exam up in a place called Barry, Vermont. And uh, the exam center was uh, to take the exam there. I was going to be in the basement of a Methodist church. And I traveled the day before. The exam takes three days. It's Wednesday afternoon, all day Thursday, all day Friday. I traveled on Tuesday. I got to the Brown Derby Hotel in Barry, Vermont, and I got to my room, uh, opened all my books to begin to prepare for taking this exam, and uh, my mind went blank. Even though I had all this material in front of me, I couldn't tell a debit from a credit or, uh, or what. I, had, I was at the end of my rope. I sat there for a few minutes trying to collect myself, kind of panicking. And I reached into my um, bag of books and discovered that I had left my Bible at home. That was the first mistake. I had traveled, I had prepared, I had studied, but somehow I thought I was going to do this by myself. And I hadn't prayed to God, I hadn't concluded Him in this. Oh, sure, there were occasions when I did, but my serious concentration was on my study. And here I was, facing this exam with a blank mind. So, I looked around the room. I had heard somewhere that sometimes some guys named the Gideons put Bibles in hotel rooms, so I looked in the Brown Derby in my room, and, and lo and behold, God had put, had caused the Gideon to place a Bible in that room. And I opened that Bible and one of the verses that we're considering today came to me. I opened it. I let the Bible fall open. It fell to Proverbs. I started reading in chapter 1. And if you read those verses, you know that Solomon is speaking as God, speaking to his son, and God speaking to this son and to you, the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of knowledge is the fear of God. And as I read those verses, I understood that I had left God out of the equation and I needed to go back to him. And for the rest of the evening, I didn't open my textbooks. I opened the real textbook, the Bible, and just continued to read. And God, as Pastor just described, um, uh, I, he did great favor to me. I didn't pass the whole exam, but I passed enough to keep on going, and, and I passed it all later on, and God blessed that career. But the point was that 
um, I, be, I was brought back to where I needed to be in the presence of God through his word. And that was my first exposure to the Gideons, and we'll talk about that a little later. Thank you, um, Ed. Um, I remember uh, when I was taking my exam, I think it was engineering exam, it was like eight hour thing, and it's also open book uh, exam, and um, I had a whole like big uh, suitcase full with books. Just in case there's a question from any of my textbook from the previous uh, years, I probably packed everything, and I knew I couldn't lift, but I packed everything just in case. It reminds me that I did not pack Bible either. But um, I barely passed, probably. That's the reason why. But um, now I know, now I know uh, the wisdom is that when you travel with God, and that God give you that wisdom, that insight, that that we, which we need. I've been teaching uh, high school um, young people a long, long time ago in that, um, uh, the, how to study for SATs. And uh, I'll tell them, you know, when you go take SAT, you need a little energy, you know, something that you normally may not have. You need a little energy because you're going to be nervous, you're, you're going to be drained, and you need to have some energy. So instead of advising them, take Bible with them, I would take with you some candies. You need the sugar in your brain. Now, come and think of it. I should have advised uh, both, you know, the peace of mind through the Word of God and also a little bit of candy to burst your energy to, to, to do that. So thank you for that, for that testimony. The important thing is, the important thing is, at the nick of the time, when he went blank, when he uh, focused on the word of God and he came back to him. That's the power. That's how God meets us at the end of the road. So let me finish the message by just reading the full text of Isaiah 55, 11 that, that we just read. Uh, it starts with uh, uh, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways and my ways, declares Lord. You know, this is basically saying, well, you know, I'm taking this exam. What do I need a Bible for? I need a textbook that I've studied uh, in the past. You know, you need a textbook. But the thing is, his thoughts are not our thoughts. You know, technically, when you are taking this uh, career exam, your know, life is on the line too. So you're sort of in a different way. You're at the end of the rope, you know. And that's when you need him the most. But I believe uh, through uh, Ed's testimony, what he's really saying is this. Yes, he forgot everything. But he remembers for the rest of his life that God's provision, God's intent to add was carry me with you everywhere you go and I'll be with you. It doesn't matter when you're taking the exam, a challenging time, and especially when you're at the end of the rope. Commit to me in my words. Then I will show you each and every time. I believe that has become Ed's foundation of faith. Verse 9, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Verse 10, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seeds for the sowers and bread for the eater. All the challenges that we face has a purpose. There's God's intent in it. Just like rain, it will turn back to heaven, but not until it waters the earth and make transformation. Verse 11 is what we just read earlier. So is my word. 
that goes out from my mouth. What do we say? He, when he created us, he breathed. He breathed his Holy Spirit upon us so that we can have the breath of life. So it is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. Believe in this. Believe in this. And you hang on to his word. It's not just the word. It's, it's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit who is active and alive. And I will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent you. That's God's promise. That's our hope. And the fact that Jesus died on the cross, his love for us did not return empty. He was resurrected to bring us back home. Verse 12, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Simply put, God is good. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you. We raise our hands and we praise you. Yes, we clap our hands to worship you, to honor you, Father. So we thank you, thank you for your word. The words that's written in the Bible, it's not just the words. It's you, yourself. It's living, it's active. There's a power, there's healing, there's hope. Father, we desire to meet you, not only along the way, but also when we are at the end of the road. For we now know that you are at the end of the road. And Jesus, your son, has so truly demonstrated that, that you were at the end of the road. You were at that cross. We thank you for your words. We pray this in Jesus' name. Um, before we go on to the praise, um, at this time, I just want to share a little bit with you about the ministry of uh, Gideon or Gideon ministry. So we'll begin with uh, uh, videotape. I got involved in drugs while I was in dental school thinking that I could do both, be a graduate student by day and doing drugs and partying. Well, this whole time my parents, they had been a Christian for several years now and just had really grown in their faith. My parents knew the only way they would be able to see me since I wanted nothing to do with them. They actually flew down to Atlanta one time and after the second day I kicked them out. But my dad, he wanted to give me something and it was his very first Bible and he left it on my kitchen counter. But as soon as they left, I took his Bible and I threw it in the trash can. My mom prayed that God would do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to the Father. Well, this miracle, this answer to prayer came one day with a bang on my door. I opened up my door and on my front doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs and they confiscated all my money and my drugs and I was charged with a street value equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. I was walking around the cell block and I passed by this garbage can and as I looked at that garbage can, I felt like I was looking at my own life. And I was about to pass by that garbage can, but something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over and I picked it up and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell and for the very first time I opened up that New Testament and I read through the entire Gospel of Mark. And as I know today, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper, but what we have in our Bibles is the very breath of God. And it's living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword. And as I began to read God's word, it began to penetrate me. And it began to cut through my stubborn, hard heart. He revealed his plan for my life. And he called me full-time ministry while I was in prison 
So the greatest miracle of this whole story is that actually Moody accepted me. I was released from prison in July of 2001, and I started the very next month. I'm teaching now back at Moody in the Bible department, so I tell people I went from prisoner to professor. Only God can do that. As you can see, uh, God's word does not return void. He threw the word of God in the trash, and in prison, he picked the word of God up out of the trash, and it converted his soul. Now, how can you be used of God to help transform a life like Christopher's? You can first of all pray for this church to continue its outreach into the community. You can make the Gideon ministry a tool to be used in accomplishing this outreach for the Lord. The Gideons, as a partner with this church, needs your prayers and your support. You can support us by joining us with, as a member or as a friend. You can uh, also spread the word of God um, and help us spread the word of God into the community as a friend of the Gideons uh, or a member. We are uh, in uh, hotels and schools and colleges uh, right here locally as well as around the world. We have placed over 2,000 copies of God's Word right here in Montgomery County this past year. Our local group is responsible for 23 hotels and schools like the middle schools in right here in Norristown on Markley Street and Marshall Street, where just last week we stood on the sidewalk and gave 600 New Testaments to the students as they walked by. The students in your congregation can distribute what we call the life book to fellow students in the schools they attend. We've been on Temple's campus We've even distributed tracks at the Hatboro Car Show. A few years ago, the Gideons International introduced an app, and uh, I don't have the little card with me, but it's an app to put on your cell phone, and in this app, you can download scriptures in 1,100 different languages and dialects. You can support this outreach financially by a direct gift today by using the bulletin inserts that you were given, um, or the Gideon Bible program, card Bible program, or Friends of Gideon's. I want to relate to you another opportunity, another exposure to how God does not let his word return void. I recently had a conversation with a longtime friend, and he mentioned to me that uh, a Gideon Place Testament was used in his own conversion. I asked him for the story. It goes something like this. I better read this if I'm going to debate with him over it. Those were the words of my friend Rob Burchett as he reached for the Gideon Place Testament he was given on the campus of Purdue University. He was a doctoral candidate in the electrical engineering program. His friend, a molecular biologist, had invited Rob to come to a Bible study. Rob was intending to take this opportunity to destroy his friend's faith. Rob was not a friend of Jesus Christ nor his word. His intent was to go to this Bible study and destroy what his friend believed. However, even though God was, uh, Rob was studying uh, great power in, this, in studying electrical engineering. Electricity is very powerful. Rob didn't understand the power that he held in his hand. Rob began to read that Gideon Place Testament. And as he began to read, God changed his life. The power of God's word convicted him of his sinful nature. And soon thereafter, Rob repented of his sin and became uh, a believer 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. He wound up going to that Bible study with a total different purpose than what he initially set out to do. And God has made Rob a powerful preacher of his word, of God's word, instead of Rob using his intellect to destroy his friend's belief, God has turned Rob around and used his intellect to convert sinners to Christ. The Gideons, uh, this past October, completed what we call a Bible blitz in the city of Philadelphia. And God used over 200 Gideons and their wives in, from Pennsylvania and Delaware and Maryland to distribute over, eight, over 81,000 pieces of scripture into the city of Philadelphia. 19,000 of those scriptures were placed on college campuses throughout the city. Although Rob's testimony occurred many years ago, we pray that God will use the testaments placed this past October to work in the lives of the college students who have received them. As you may recall, the Gideon ministry, as is noted earlier, was, is a worldwide ministry in scope. We are organized in 200 countries around the world, and we publish God's Word in 107 languages. There are 268,000 of us, um, Gideons and their wives, in these 200 countries. This next part fits wonderfully at the end of a rope. Um, while I was in Buenos Aires, Argentina, helping to give out Bibles on what's called an international blitz, I met Javier Salas. He was a local Gideon. We together, uh, for the whole week, had given out God's word. He was a local leader uh, of the local team, and he was serious about giving out God's word. Um, when I arrived and uh, the other uh, Gideons from around the world, there were 20 of us that came from other countries to help the Argentinian Gideons, uh, I was instructed to be back at the hotel uh, by 6 o'clock so I could have dinner and go to a meeting to review what had happened that day. Well, on Monday morning, when I met Javier at 7.30 in the morning, Javier said, Ed, through an interpreter, because I didn't speak Spanish and he didn't speak English, said, you're not going to make it back to the hotel at 6 o'clock. We're here to give out Bibles. And so we did every day. From about 6 in the morning until 9 at night, I was giving out Bibles. Every day, we visited colleges and schools. And when, during the middle of the day, we also visited several police stations. So I kind of joked with Javier through the interpreter, how did he know where all these police stations were? Uh, they weren't really obvious. They were back in all these other neighborhoods. And uh, I was just kind of joking. But Javier, through the interpreter, told me that Friday afternoon when we were done, he would tell me his story. At the age of 10, Javier was basically put on the street and became a drug addict, 10 years old. By the age of 30, he was on the hardest drugs money could buy. And as you've heard about that lifestyle, um, money is hard to come by, so you do things that put you in the police station when you're trying to get your habit paid for. God had told, had made Javier aware of a church in the area that had many of his other drug addicts had received help through. And one Sunday morning, God woke up Javier from a drunken stupor. And as he put it, he should have never been awake at that time in the morning. But Javier ran from that building to that church. And through that church ministry and a Gideon Place Testament, God took his drug addiction from him instantly. He had no withdrawal. He had no problems giving up drugs completely done with them. Javier knew the power of God's word. If you could have met him as I did, you would have seen a man almost possessed. Uh, we gave, Javier was intent on making sure that the people of Buenos Aires 
got a New Testament placed in their hands because he knew the power. God's word will not return void. It will accomplish that which it is sent to do. As I mentioned, distributing testaments on the sidewalks in schools um, where students walk off the campus, many schools have virtually no students that walk off of campuses. Years ago, we were allowed to go into schools and hand out testaments. But as you know, we're no longer able to do that. So, God has led the Gideons to create the LifeBook distribution program. This program, which is facilitated through church youth groups and pastors, involves an in-school, student-to-student distribution by Christian high school youth to their classmates. They are given an attra- this attractive book that's referred to as the Life Book. Um, the Life Book program started in 2010, and since then, over 16 million copies of the Life Book Uh, which contains the Gospel of John, have been provided to Christian youth groups free of charge for the distribution to their peers. You can continue to help us um, distribute God's Word. As I said, being involved personally in the Gideon ministry, helping us financially, but most of all, we really covet your prayers. Without prayer, this ministry doesn't go on. But there are a number of means available to you. You can become a friend of Gideon's. Um, You can support us through the Gideon card program. And there's a display of those cards out there when you have a loved one or a friend that you want to honor or memorialize. You can take that card, send the card, and in that card you acknowledge having given a gift to that person of X amount of Bibles. And then you send that gift to the Gideon's. Um, it's a great way to commemorate a friend. Um, He's blessed or she's blessed by receiving that card. And then the person who receives a Bible that you paid for somewhere in the world is blessed by receiving that Bible. And then you are blessed knowing that you've done, um, you've distributed a Bible through your gift. If you have any questions about uh, the ministry, uh, I'll be here for a while afterwards. You can certainly ask. And I, I just want to close by saying that this ministry, this is not about me or the Gideons or this church. It is all about what our Lord and Savior does with his word. It's not placed void for him.